A movement FPS. There's a video game with movement and first person. All caught up? Cool. This is my fourth video on the genre, but it's also technically my third, and given no good movement game ever reaches the number three, I'm gonna pull a superstitious card here and avoid all rule of thirds for the remainder of this video. I said all. This is gonna be like a bunch of small videos in a trench coat. They're gonna pull out a bat labeled Pacing Whiplash, and I'm not gonna tell them to stop swinging, but I'll stand by with an Ico Forces card to patch you up. And with hurtboxes like these, eh, that might be pretty often. A few big changes have hit the scene of this genre. Here's the quickfire updates. Hyperscape servers officially shut down. I can see a lot of you thinking, what's Hyperscape? So if you're wondering why it died, well, there's your answer. Paladins is still going strong, and it adds new champions about as often as a guitarist loses their picks, with a pretty similar rate of old ones showing up again right when they already bought replacements. We'll talk more about that later though. Titanfall 2 has been going through some deja vu, deja vu. Hey, is this book a reprint? Why'd it happen though? Who knows? Maybe it's because deja vu, deja vu. Yeah, I've definitely read this before. If you haven't already, you should still play the game's campaign mode. Whatever conceptions you have about militaristic sci-fi games don't mean nothing here. Titanfall 2 is such a distinct take on the genre that I feel like you're not listening to me. I feel like, I think, that I, I don't think you really get it. Let me write it on a BT flight's easy when Jack C laps back, backs intersect with that. My effect is all the cause is action for me, I call it protocol three. I know I'm contradicting everything I said initially, but I'm always counting on the gauntlet. So I need three of the axes to account the scale of my GVC crush dreams. Like Titans could destroy walls. What? Why would they cut that? And some Titans are exclusive to the campaign like Brutus. I do not like rapping through this, so I won't. The actual settings go hard as hell too, like this giant active factory line or the traversable past and present of a research building. Still not sold yet? Consider the following. Funny ragdoll. This ain't just a campaign tacked onto a multiplayer game, it's the onion ring you find in a bag of fries that elevates your meal into- Are you still listening to this metaphor? Go play the campaign, silly! For what it's worth, I haven't had too much trouble queuing for multiplayer as of this recording, but it's also mid-sale, and after that's over, good luck finding a healthy match. A lot of the veteran scenes migrated to the community game client called Northstar. It's pretty great. Seeing people pick up the pieces of an unmaintained franchise gives me hope that community content will exist long after the afterlife of I swear this book was new in the store. Oh god, there's five more now. I don't have the shelf space for this. This guy's going the wrong way. There's an arrow on the ground. Yeah. A bit over a month ago, I got into the Gundam Evolution beta test. I put in a solid dozen hours, but I didn't record any of that. So you and me? We're just gonna pretend this footage I yoinked is totally me playing. It's an amalgamation of every competitive shooter on the market. It's hero-based with CS-style game modes, mecha suits, and kind of janky movement. Why are you looking at me? Gundams feel like a grab bag of five mechanics you vaguely heard of before slapped together under one Evangelion. Here's Tracer Pistols, a Torbjorn Turret, and a Mercy Heal Beam. You can use all three at once. We'll throw in flight for good measure because, unlike Nuance, movement abilities are now obligatory. Honestly, I'm kinda tired of the design philosophy of everyone as a power weapon ultimate because when everyone's super, nobody is. But that didn't stop me from getting a kick out of it. Dash movement has this bob and weeb flow to it that meshes well with the Brawly Gundam abilities. The combat that's fun. The actual maps you play on are objective funnels with, you guessed it, uphill offenses and long respawn rollouts. Daring today, aren't we? There's not many ways to think outside the box. You can't even think above the box because prop collision doesn't let you stand on top of them. I know the draw of Gundams isn't the fact they're huge entities, but they really do feel like normal sized dudes running around a map with tiny props on it. Even though you're technically giant, there's no sense of scale because nothing tiny ever interacts with the gameplay. It's a shame no game exists that illustrates how scale could be utilized as a gameplay mechanic, with multiple size classes of entities very directly interacting with each other. Oh yeah, it does exist, and you still haven't played it for some reason. It's called Godzilla Destroy All Monsters. Anyways, if you like games that feel like every other game minus any distinct iteration, then truthfully, Gundam's pretty fun. Beta is as beta does, so that could change. I just think it's dumb when games pay while playable characters, especially when they all have such forgettable names you can't remember who is who to begin with. So two of them are sequels to Gundams that aren't actually in the game. Four of them have Gundam in their name. One is just named Gundam. Another is Turn a Gundam. That's just a sentence. There's Gun Tank. I actually like Gun Tank. 
It's probably going to be another victim of the mecha curse, and if it's not, I'll probably play it a few more times. Hey, cool, Splitgate's back. Oh, Halo Infinite finally came out, and there's a lot to say about it. A lot of cool indie demos have dropped, and like usual, I want to bring up all the ones I really got a kick out of. Two words. Turbo over. Kill. Let me try that again. Chain. Saw. Leg. Whatever. Occasionally you find a game so cool all you have to do is describe it objectively to sell someone on it. I'm sliding around a skate park with a smart pistol and I should probably reiterate a chainsaw strap to my leg. It's a surprisingly thorough movement system. There's sliding, dashing, and then there's slide dashing. There's wall running, there's running on the wall. There's blast jumping, a mostly impractical mechanic that occasionally makes a clever shortcut for anyone replaying the game. And the texture art in this game? Phenomenal. There's these fun slidey spots, but you gotta be cautious where you're sliding, because if you go into an explosive barrel with, um, your chainsaw leg, the maps are open, but they're not room locked, so you really do feel like you're exploring, like you're getting rewarded for finding secret spots high above the room. You're so egregiously overpowered and over mobile. If you catch on to that quick, there's some fascinating area skips to accidentally pull off because you were just going too funkin' fast, I guess. Weapon mechanics are a mix of familiar with a lower threshold of only the fun stuff. There's no fluff. It goes right to the good part. Each little pause in the action's like a tree, like a roller coaster inching up to the top of another drop. Just on the off chance someone involved with the game sees this, my only feedback is that the demo has a few bugs on replay where required events occasionally don't trigger unless you manually set them up by pulling out the weapon you were supposed to unlock before. It's a demo so fun my first critique only materialized after a second playthrough. Like usual, I'm not putting a rating on a shorter demo, but yeah, you should probably play it. Severed Steel, when played straight out of the box, is like a mashup of Fear's Grunt Assassination with the hypermobility of whatever, take your pick. See, I bring up Fear because similar to it early on, you end up in these liminal situations of not knowing where to go in an excess of indistinguishable hallways and locked doors. If that were the whole game, this would be a pretty different review. But then you find the arm cannon. Then it becomes a whole new game. Nearly everything and every one is destructible at the hands of your, well, hands? There's a limited supply of terrain-breaking shots, but you refill them by siphoning energy off mechanically packing enemies, which produces these intense sitches of chasing a yeeted ragdoll across hellfire. Now and then I would see a jump and think, oh, I can't make that. And then I break new ground. The mantra here is, if you can't take a door, make a door. Severed Steel doesn't want you to play it the right way. I don't even think a right way exists. Some levels that could take you, I don't know, a dozen tries to beat could also be completed before I finish this sentence because ultimately every goal's a whole. Maybe the most valid simplification of this game is that it does a lot with a little. The story is coherent, but not captivating. The audio design's serviceable, but not commendable. The level design? Well, <laughs> let's just say this is supposed to be a laptop. This is... Treat, 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 treat. There's levels that are teleporter-centric, destruction-centric ones. There's one where you collect a crowbar, a golden gun, and... <laughs> very funny, but nobody would ever wear that. Severed Steel, uh, excuse my language here, carves out a niche for itself pretty well. If that wasn't enough, it's also got a mostly intuitive stage builder running through beta already. As is customary in my culture, I use this to build a comically overscaled two-fort. It's a mashup of inspirations that really do end up as more than the sum of their parts. Super Hot, John Wick, I'm even getting an aroma of Metroid Prime in there somewhere. I've got to keep you people on your toes here. I'm rating it Spotify Sessions. During the last Steam Next Fest, a demo dropped called Neon White. The easiest explanation for it is a platform shooter where cards function as both your weapon and your movement ability. Ergo, if you eat through your ammo, you eat through your movement ability too. I especially dig the rocket launcher doubling as a grapple, and since killing every enemy on stage is mandatory, you have to make quick work of them while under pressure of not missing your next jump. There's also a... You are my sass game, man. The darkness to my light. Non-gameplay half to this demo as well. I know you don't remember, but you were once a great teacher, <laughs> Mr. White. <laughs> I guess it's pulling inspiration from visual novels. I could overanalyze its reliance on anime archetypes and write the game off, or I could just write you a sticky note. 
Being a speedrun platformer, the stages are all fast with differing central mechanics. The better levels are tricky puzzles involving kill order and ammo conservation, while the weaker ones are pretty straightforward gameplay padding between hair color personality the show. Can't believe God himself decided to bless me with the thing I love most. Obtuse symbolism. It's interesting to hold multiple weapon types and have to decide on the fly which to burn and which to use later. It's less about emergent solutions and more about memorizing what works, but finding that order is the name of the game. There's a pretty scalable gameplay loop and cast of characters here to flesh out. I'm not totally sold on the ladder, and the former hinges on how much the ladder either improves or how often I'll have to mash through the ladder to get to the former. Preferably the former of the ladder rather than the ladder of the former. Basically, worst case scenario, it's still pretty cool. No rating. And there we go. I'm glad we're through the indie game section three. Th 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 there's actually a few more of these I want to talk about. <laughs> can't find the hoop. Are you the hoop? Grapple Hoops is one of the coolest pitches with not the coolest final result, and I would say more, but there's not enough content here to reach a second sentence, so instead of stopping, I'm gonna make this a run-on, because that's what playing this game feels like, and also repeating the same level 20 times with different buildings doesn't strike me as compelling progression, comma, especially since the game introduces no new hazards, objectives, or interactables after the first level semicolon. In fact, the game jumped from demo to final result so fast, it's clear a lot of QOL never reached the product, comma. I get the vibe this came from a younger game dev, and I want to be constructive because it's a cool concept. They just need to know bosses or sandbags. Levels feels like someone randomly placed hoops around a Unity prefab and called it a day. So all in all, if you felt like this sentence needed any of the following, colon, <laughs> tempo shift, structural formatting, so-called quotation marks, or any other breath of air, then congrats. You also understand the value of changing level design so each one doesn't blend into each other. In other words, I rated the Not Rad Ratitude tracks in a bingo rack with Rax Candy stack. Maybe the devil turn it around and I'm only rating it at all because the game released with a price tag when it shouldn't have. <laughs> Plenty of games want you to beat them as fast as possible, but few actually let you move as fast as physically possible. Cyberhook is an exception. Your entire goal is me go fast, me say word. You've got a grapple, a pea shooter, and lots of blocks with different properties. Yellow ones can't be grappled, purple ones can't be touched, red ones can't be grappled or touched, glassy blocks can be passed through, green blocks can be destroyed, pink blocks can be recruited as party members, totems can change block properties. Every level's got multiple paths, right? Slow and steady or any percent gamer mode. This speaks a personal question within you. Are you the type of person to mash the restart button the second you miss a grapple, or are you the kind of course correct at the last possible moment and keep going? There's a time stop mechanic, but using it doesn't slow down the timer, so there's a trade-off. And truthfully, the best of the best will never have to use this at all. I use it. You'd figure with so few mechanics, the game would have a limited scope, but there's a lot of memorable platforming types. Bunny hopping, swinging monkey bars, some are just dodging. <laughs> there's a story here, but the game forgot to tell it, so I forgot to remember it. It's hard to preach to you the appeal of mindless speedrunning if you're not already familiar with those parkour -y games. Like, it, it doesn't matter what it's like, really. It's fun. What a great example of a grapple game with lots of tricks up its sleeve. Not exactly a substantive use of your time, but then again, you're on YouTube right now, aren't you? Some levels are absolutely heinous. They'll leave you with a grudge. The rest of them are fast. Me like fast. Speed word go. Rate Pacific Daydream. Better than remember. Still bad end. Play Ultra Kill. 
At least, that's what a lot of indie devs are doing these days. The influence of Ultra Kill seems to be more and more prevalent across my recommendations page. I've already talked about this masterpiece before, and I have an LED picture frame displaying its live Twitter feed next to my bed so the first thing I can do every morning is caress it longingly, but I haven't talked about the ripple effect it's been having across smaller game devs. Ultra Kill obviously hasn't pioneered so many concepts as much as it has just standardized a certain vibe, and for all I know, a lot of this is parallel thinking, but let's be honest, a pal Paladin's character ricocheting a bullet off a coin? Who's to say where it came from? Maybe someone on the team recently watched Winchester 73, or maybe Paladins took something from another game. As for indies, there's plenty of demos that sample Ultra Kill's art style, combat style, music style, basically everything except the literal style meter, funnily enough, which Ultra Kill itself didn't even invent. All right, I get it. I think for smaller upcoming devs, there is utility to reverse engineering your favorite games. There's still a line between homage and forgery, but speaking as a player, at least, I like to look at it constructively. Constructively. Reaver, despite its surface appearance of being a pretty on-the-nose Ultra Kill clone, I mean, yeah, you got a ground pound and a dash and two weapon types and unapologetically counterfeit particles and breakbeat metal music for your ultimate, you punch your bullet, come on, you're not making this an easy introduction. Even though it's a really, really blatant game dev fan fiction, I also see a lot of promising iteration here. For example, weapon recoil is in itself a movement mechanic, either repelling you upwards or sucking you inwards depending on a specific weapon's mode. Mobility is totally uncapped, so you you can bounce off walls indefinitely or b-hop across wide open sections. Also, there are NPCs who can say FUNK. That's almost mechanical at this point. Ironically, the coolest parts of this game are the parts that aren't trying so hard to replicate a formula, but since so much of it is, I think it's fair to lovingly draw a few observations. In Ultra Kill, levels either have physical hazards that influence player movement, or they have non-combat objectives that influence player pacing. There's room lock, but sometimes you can just fucking skip past it entirely, and other times the room ends so fast you don't even think of it as a roadblock. Basically, you're always asked to do something or be mindful of something that can't be overcome just by shooting it. Reaver demo, at least as of this video, is only about the combat, and when the rooms have nearly no active hazards on top of locking every single door behind a combat sequence, all that movement starts to feel superfluous. Here's one more observation. Ultra Kill doesn't just spawn every enemy back to back every room every wave mostly. Sometimes there's intentional simplicity to it. The times it does throw everything which is sparse there's usually a catch like double guns in an elongated hallway. Meanwhile I feel like Reaver just constantly throws sinks at me and then stares at its wristwatch until I kill them all. I still can't tell what shtick it's trying to curve into. Is it a platformer? Is it story driven? Until I have more context it's hard to visualize the bigger picture here that separates it from you know who. There's a personality here buried underneath all its copied mannerisms. Maybe the same can be said of us all deep down. And there it is, our indie roundup for the di- th 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 Actually, one more word. Rogue? Likes. It's not often you see a mix of this genre with arena shooter. Just RoboQuest, Ziggurat 2, Mist Hunter, Tower of Guns, Immortal Redneck, BPM, Void Bastards, Mother Gunship, Strafe. How many is that? Nine? Shoot. Uh, Nightmare Reaper and Carlson. There, I said it. If I stopped to write a page for every one of these games I found, I'd spend every day of my life playing them and every other day writing about them. No thank you, I'll settle for six days a week, thank you very much. Just know that whatever amount of movement shooters you think there are, the barrel always goes deeper. For now, I'm setting a cutoff point for myself and moving to the next section. Just know that me mentioning a game in passing doesn't mean I won't eventually talk about it in depth. It's more like a public reference for me to point to and say, yeah, I know that game, thanks for commenting about it. Maps. Spam. A game is only as good as its maps. Last Paladin's map three years ago. Siege three years ago. Citation. Valorant two years ago. Overwatch three years ago. Citation. Whether or not it's a result of remote working, lots of games are making less maps and more characters, cosmetics, etc. One byproduct of this is you get lots of things to play as, but less places to play them. Nine new agents, three new maps. Ten new champions, zero new maps. Four new heroes, two new maps, and oh cool, they removed one. This isn't just economics though. Yeah, maps are a huge workload to make, but there's another creeping factor to their production. Competitive viability. If developers bleed all their time into a map only for it to be totally rejected in high level play, well then what's the point in making it at all, right? At least that feels like the common philosophy of Clash FPS these days. The maps we do get are usually slight iterations with formulaic choke points and objectives, and only during rare specific events do we get anything remotely experimental. I'm not even talking about a specific game, by the way. This pretty globally applies to most team games now. There's this one game I like that.
I was CP standings on the CP standing. It was seedier than speedy, meaty feet and sprees. Please can and fodder standings understand this and wonder what changed. These devils turned your levels into video cats. All the same, I don't mean to endure duress, but this comp could decompress. I guess they revel in the levels made for high level guests. Sometimes it's nice to break away. In particular, I'm a fan of Doomsday and Watergate. And payload race, I'll play pastime when cue times accelerate. Dig through the rock, the weeds, and dig root underneath. It's a truth made to please, not to appease views. I'll try to state it in a simpler way. The maps these games made were mostly made for ranked play. Maybe we could get more casual, experimental, no innuendo, and hopefully it ends well. I lost consciousness. I didn't rap, did I? This keeps happening. Overwatch 2, more like. Oh. Four, two. To me, this is the most fun state the game's been in since, uh, honestly, it's the most fun state the game's been in. Stun mechanics are mostly cut, main tank was actually given a speaking role in the play, and maybe most notably of all is a fundamental reassessment of its map design. 2CP is at best completely absent, and at worst slightly absent, but majorly reworked. By contrast, a new game mode called Push was introduced. It's a tug of war where one objective can be moved to the end of either team's route. If you think about it hard enough, this could even be considered a form of 5 CP. Interesting. Very interesting. Everyone's got an opinion, but personally I really like it. The removal of a second tank and the general acceleration of pacing has basically made the flank more practical to use than before, where every fight would usually culminate in a dogpile on the objective. The game is still nothing but a dogpile on the objective, but at least now that objective isn't one static position with the same vantage points every push. Since it moves across the stage, every push is generally a little different than the one before it. Since push goes two ways, it almost means you aren't stuck on hard offense or defense for the entire round if you can help it. It's probably Overwatch's most dynamic game mode to date. That's not the same as being flawless, but with a historical president like this, good start. If I were to cherry pick deeper into Overwatch's map design, I would say that having such a widely DPS-centered balance results in what I'd call the stage play effect. Tank stand in the tank spot, healers move to the healer spots, and the DPS chase wherever the spotlight is pointed. This problem is why I stopped playing Overwatch 1, and while it's thankfully downplayed in the Redux beta, there's still this constant sense of where you should and shouldn't be on the map. If you should be somewhere, you might hear a fellow actor say, Great, Great job. job. Wait, let me finish. Great job remembering that line tree main. There's generally a reward for creative use of movement abilities, but it doesn't make any effort to reward creative navigation given a lack of movement abilities. Basically, if you're Orissa, you're not going to find a clever shortcut up a wall no matter how hard you look at it. Generally, tanks aren't as shield-centric anymore, a critically massive development, but it's still pretty clear the better picks are high mobility, high damage absorption tanks, while the actual brawly area control ones are left in the dust. I'm not saying more flexible map design would change that, but if you really wanted to buff these characters without outright buffing these characters, occasional shortcuts up to high ground or standable props seems fair to me. Overwatch, Redux, whatever you want to call it, is not four years of work. It's not a finished product, and maybe worst of all, it's still a casual game restructured into an esport by devs who are either too micromanaged to address that, or just outright too disconnected to ever address it. Either way, I'm not much better since I'm still giving the game and company free attention. Whatever. Buff fair and give Orisa more skins, please. That's about the extent of my opinion. I'm gonna go play Paladins now. Every time I boot this up, it seems like they've added a new champion. In fact, while I was writing this, they added a new champion. I can't say the same for maps, which is wild given how active development is otherwise. There's even nine unfinished maps catching dust in the files. If there's a reason behind this, well, your guess is as good as mine. It's not like Modern Siege is that perfect of a map type. It's like 5 CP, but whoever wins mid becomes a permanent attacker for the round. To top it off, there's egregious sight lines, flanks that rarely split from the main area, an arguable amount of over-mobility, and on top of all that, there's nothing particularly dynamic about the objective. It feels like Paladins has mechanically outgrown its game modes, but the map design hasn't adjusted for it. I couldn't pin down why this was the case until I learned about old Paladins. Way back in the Alpha days, Siege mode looked something like this. Three lanes, each with a middle control point. Whichever team captured a point would push a payload to the end of said lane while destroying three gates along the way. Meanwhile, whichever team lost the lane would attempt to destroy that payload before it got to the end of it. 
Also, while not widely present, you would find multiple levels of elevation to position on. This era of Paladins didn't reach the final cut. Siege mode got simplified down to a single midpoint, a non-destructible payload, and the total removal of gates. When you consider new Siege as one remnant of an earlier game mode, that kind of makes sense. I got curious whether Hi-Rez would ever attempt a reintroduction of its old game mode. After all, it sounds pretty dynamic and cool compared to new Siege. Well, it turns out the answer is sorta yes. They call it Siege Beyond. Beyond what, you're expiration date? <laughs> nah, I'm just palin'. The siege is now destructible by defenders and moves forward no matter what until it's broken. When it does break, a cap point spawns on the flank which lets the attackers rebuild their siege and keep pushing. In a way, it sort of addressed both my complaints, that the objective isn't dynamic enough and that the flanks are devoid of a meaningful resource. The remaining concern is that maps are still unnaturally small relative to the movement abilities. These flank objectives aren't that far away from the main hallway where everyone's standing already. This makes me wonder whether the lack of new maps is because they want to build future ones around a new game mode, or if Hi-Rez would actually just prefer to rework old maps for the rest of time. I really hope not, because there's only four game modes, and one of them isn't even fun. I'd rather get something new at this point, and a half measure to revert Siege doesn't get me excited. I do appreciate their effort, though. Still a fun game. Gets kind of predictable after a while. Also, they nerfed ROM. And I'm not... And I'm not mad about it. Shadow Warrior is a series I would love to say has strong, timeless roots in the early era of FPS games. <laughs> you no mess with Lo Wang. <laughs> oh, I think my dinghy hanging out. It doesn't. The game itself was a pretty interesting absurdification of Duke Nukem with over-the-top guns and improvisable demon body part weapons. Kawabunga. But this ill-nuanced cultural mishmashing and characteristically racist voice acting is something I'm not equipped to unpack. Especially since this isn't the era of Shadow Warrior I started the series with. If you know nothing about the 1997 Shadow Warrior, there's so many conflicting Eastern ideologies, it'd be hard to see this as anything deeper than a futile effort to stand out. I'm not here to explain cultural sensitivity to you, though. I'm here to explain video games! Woohoo! If miracles weren't real, I couldn't say this game got rebooted in 2013. This is all about dashing and slashing to your heart's content. Or, put a better way, dashing and slashing to your enemy's heart contents. Like the original game, stronger enemy corpses can be repurposed into weapons. Demon hearts, for example, being a squeezable one-hit kill. And demon heads producing what I can only describe as... ...stream of mouth piss. There's three forms of character progression. Skills, weapons, and power. Oh, and, uh, I don't know, moral development. Skills mainly refer to input-based sword combos and passive effects, like a jab move or a spin attack. Weapons all have notable attachments on them that can be bought using money you find across the game. Your powers are a lot like your skills, but mainly raise the effectiveness of abilities and defensiveness. It's a lot of exponential progression to take in, but the gameplay is still pretty standard fair room clearing. This came out before the soft reboot of Doom, but the franchise's influence will definitely get more and more apparent over time. There's nothing too hard to comprehend. Kill the stronger demons and summoner demons first, then clear the room afterwards. In lieu of key cards, you're usually busting down lamps to access progression points. Here's what I was able to remember of the story. Lo Wang, you, is an assassin working for Zilla. You're supposed to go retrieve a sword for your boss, but out of mutual interest and necessity, Wang makes a deal with this mischievous demon, Hoji. Hey, don't you go fading on me now. Say you accept. Come on. A like asshole, C like champion. I... Accept. That's the spirit. So is that the point of the mask? Wang and Hoji are gonna go collect three swords and then merge them into one fancy immortal slaying blade. I guess Hoji, figuratively speaking, procreated with his sister, and then literally speaking, procreated his sister, producing clay golem husks of her to protect the swords and store some discarded familial memories of her. Hoji's got this brother, Enra, who wasn't too happy about him railing his sister and then building life-size dolls of her afterwards. Wang decides it would be best to help Hoji kill his brother, bring back his sister, and undo all the earth-shaking domino effects produced from Hoji giving his sister the sword. You sound like a racist, but all you demons really do look alike. Why? 
This plot synopsis couldn't be summarized down onto any less than 40 fortune cookies, which unfunnily enough is about how many terrible fortune cookie puns you'll find throughout the game. You will be attacked by demons. Live Wang and prosper. Cardboard belt is a waste of paper. No one ever died of a broken heart, but a heart sliced from their chest while they look on screaming? Not gonna lie, that's killed a couple people. I take back what I said. With that much room to write, maybe the plot could fit across 20 cookies. With Hoji bonded to your brain, you'll spend a lot of time listening to him drop commentary on your play-by-play. -play. I like their style, hot and bossy. I'm sure you around like that. You're going to need to work on the hot part. Bitch. 5,000 hitmen in this country, and I have to get the nerd? Where do you keep your porn? This is my porn. This story's juggling a lot of balls at once. Yakuza ties, Shadow Realms, Incest, Godhood, but at its core, it's all swinging a stick and unloading on your enemies' faces. Stop giggling. When Shadow Warrior does everything right, it's a pretty memorable junction of setting, mechanics, and plot. At its weaker points, it's subject to some really passe choices, like the idea that a big boss fight automatically means a fun one. I can't say whether it was trying anything new for the time, having only played it last year, but at least in retrospect, Shadow Warrior 1 holds up as still worth playing. I rate it Red Owl conceptually but not literally see this album has cool dad energy and that he sounds really lame and embarrassing but it's so genuine and authentic that it's actually kind of cool fuck off Shadow Warrior 2 ended up changing the structure in a few ways. Instead of the whole game moving across one straight line, there's a hub world with story missions to beeline. Or, alternatively, there's bounty missions that earn you cash and items. Levels are open-ended in a way you can run anywhere on them, and multiple missions exist across them, but you can only complete one at a time. This might have worked in its favor if the mission system didn't feel lifted straight out of a defunct MMO. Nearly every bounty is a find and kill enemies job. If you decide to stay in a level after the bounty's done, you'll find absolutely funk all to do. And that's if the level will even let you backtrack out of the arena you dropped into. If it does, you'll find enemies that drop inconsequential upgrades and chests that drop less money than is worth the time opening. The skills and powers of the past game have been merged into a card system of upgrades. Some cards you start with, while others you have to buy in-game before upgrading. The weapon system's been heavily fleshed out. There's way more iterations of existing weapon types on top of the weird and unique additions, where in the first game every weapon had three specialized attachments. Here there's there's a constant income of upgrades you can attach to any weapon. Most of them are total filler, just single digit passives and generic elemental damage. A select few attachments can be interesting, like turning a machine gun into a turret, but undeniably the dragon's horde of useful stuff is minute conveniences like reload speed and crit damage. These upgrades extend to player armor and other passive effects, but across my 8 hours of story mode and 5 hours of air quotes post game, that never amounted to much observable difference. Even the deeper systems of adding more attachments and recycling trash ones later makes no sense. What do you think happens when I combine three clip reload upgrades? I get chi after enemy killed. This game removed the improvised demon corpse weapons, probably due to how diverse the existing arsenal is, but admittedly left a hole in my chest. I mean heart. This isn't a game where you collect cool items by exploring and looting a strong enemy corpse. In fact, every intentional effort I made to explore the map and beat a thread of note amounted to a diary page and a reminder to go finish that bounty I started. No, this is a game of errands that rewards you with a new weapon to use during your next errand, rinse and repeat until you run out of rewards to reap. It's a shame because this game has a better movement and combat system than the first one. Melee combos are simplified down. There's a rudimentary jump tech where long falls produce this annoying superhero landing, but that can be circumvented by switching around the order of your dash and second jump. In an open world full of meaningful platforming and discoverable enemies, this would be great, but since it's Shadow Warrior 2, it exists in a graveyard of nothing to discover and nothing to do. If you could knock out multiple missions at a time and there were some non-combat activities to discover across levels, people probably would have latched to this formula more. I could only find one bounty that wasn't in some way a kill enemies and collect thing job. The problem is, since dead enemies drop items and all bounties have a nearly identical reward, you walk away from this non-combat one with less than a fifth of your normal loot. It's pretty clear they designed a modular weapon and ability system and then structured the whole game around it. Bounties have no impact on the hub world or the level they take place on. They exist as a device for weapon progression and that's it. It's a fun combat system, but enemy types are totally samey. Boss types have two defining qualities, a lot of health, and they enter a summoner phase when the health drops. 
everything else in this game is bullet fodder. If you played this like Shadow Warrior 1 and beeline the story, nothing makes any sense. You miss out on cool weapons, the upgrade system never totally clicks, but if you play the game how it intends you to, you find out those two things are all it has going. It made an open world and then only designed disconnected linear events to populate them. The first game took the time to make parts of the level play differently from each other to keep it fresh, but that doesn't happen here. As for the story, it's something like this. Lo Wang is doing work for the Yakuza. He's gotta go rescue the boss's daughter, Kamiko. Apparently, your boss Zilla from the last game did some wacky stuff, and now Kamiko's body is running rampant while her soul is- Are you ready? Ready? Ready for what? Hello? <sighs> Who is that? It's me. Um... Kamiko? The game's events are you trying to get her body back to normal and transfer this Yakuza waifu out of your prefrontal cortex. At first, Wang and Kamiko are constantly struggling to see the same side of things and arguing over methodology. So weird having you in my head. Yeah, I can imagine. I guess it's more like deja vu. You did something like this before. It was slightly different, but uh, I had a helper in my head for a while. It was aggravating at first, too, but eventually we became friends. Wonderful! I'm living with a schizophrenic. Yeah, well, I can tell you from experience that Zilla's not such a fan of having ex-employees running around. Most evil geniuses are that way. An evil genius is still a genius. Even when he was firing me, he was doing science. Great. Now we know what to put on your headstone. But by the end of the story, they're on parallel wavelengths. You have my back here, right? Oh yeah, fuck that fascist prick. I'll stop the body, but I'm not giving it to fucking basic. Is it me or are you growing a conscience? Hey, just don't tell anyone. It's bad for business. Rather, Rather than, than sealing, sealing the, the gates, gates closed, closed with my sacrifice, sacrifice let us seal them open with my living soul. soul. Utter nonsense. It's a pretty endearing dynamic, actually. Also, Hoji's sister comes back in this game, and it turns out she's kind of peeved about her brother and lover, in no order, dying. There's about as many new plot threads in play as there are new fortune cookies. There's too much tendency to attribute to God the evils that that man does of his own free will. I don't get this joke. Okay. No, no, you can't make him G-Mod Ragdoll in the middle of a serious scene! Shit. <laughs> like a fucking Skyrim like <laughs> I would say it's a strong narrative bottlenecked by lots of unharmonious gameplay loops. The story events exist independent of the bounty missions, but there's a few points you basically have to grind bounties just to keep up with the difficulty. Environments are so intricately stylized and well-polished, but so lacking in anything memorable. Just bridges that lead to dead ends and houses with nothing but pocket change in them. The back end of this feels like it's compensating for a lack of something. And with a protagonist named Lo Wang, well, you can figure it out. This could have been a compelling loop of cool stuff and cool open levels, but they hinged the entire game on empty questing and diminishing upgrade returns. On the bright side, bunnies are back, and they're cuter than ever. Bunny, no! It ends on a cliffhanger with Kamiko sealing the outer gates of the Shadow Realm, which is a sentence I just said, but oopsie doopsies, I guess she failed and a giant dragon got through. Or maybe she became the dragon. Or the dragon was supposed to get through? Also, did it eat Lo Wang? It looked like it ate Lo Wang. I'm sure they'll answer all this in a sequel. What a bizarre game. I rate it. What? You expect an explanation? Since you're more of a visual learner, I'm going to use educational props this time. So pay attention. This is me, Lo Wang. Yeah, it doesn't look exactly like me, but you get the idea. Hey! Hey! Shut up! Shut the fuck up! Wasn't planting my favorite ramen shop enough for you? Now you want to take him away from me? Again? What else do you want from me, huh? What do you want? Turns out that dragon destroyed damn near everything after getting out, including Lo Wang's self-esteem and general social life. There's zero mention of what happened to Kamiko, which is a little weird, but I'm more so interested in how Lo Wang now uses Hoji's mask as a safety blanket. Sorry, I meant coping mechanism. Zilla shows up and basically says, we aren't friends, but my friends are dead, so let's go kill the dragon. And get us all a little payback? Ah, 
What do you think, Hoji? Should I trust this old son of a bitch? Something Lo Wang was unable to do on his own before. It's great how much this game spotlights Lo Wang himself. In the past, he's mostly been a vehicle, both metaphorically and literally, for other characters to bounce off of. But this story is about Lo Wang's personality as a man who willingly roped himself into the center of other people's problems. Lo Wang isn't a self-important anti-hero or a blank canvas protagonist. He's a headstrong class clown who reads comic books, willingly cooperates, acknowledges his faults. <laughs> Following him in the aftermath of all those things got me pretty attached. About as attached as Wang is to that Hoji mask. What the fuck? Did she just summon a trash panda? Apparently it's still got some dormant energy fizzling in it that Zilla wants to siphon out to kill the dragon with. This gameplay is way more one than it is two. We're back to room lock progression, weapons are back to three distinct upgrades, and passives all fall under a general character menu. No goofy filler items or questing, just good old prefabs. There's now a grappling hook. Rooms usually have interactive stage hazards, another welcome addition. They really identified what made the initial reboot cool and what it needed to improve on. The only thing missing is a certain D. The bromance is back in full force, Pookie. Like the old days, Wang and Hoji are constantly riffing with each other. Everybody has one now, man. It's almost like mandatory. After you, fuckface. You are a dick. I love them so much. They really streamlined everything here into its purest form. Plot threads are kept down to the necessities, improvised demon guts are back, the writing's at its best, gameplay is about getting new firearms and wearing them out before the next one. If you haven't played the earlier games, you would still enjoy it, but seeing these character dynamics return has this epilogue sense of closure I didn't know I needed. Yeah, no, not that I don't appreciate what you did, but... No naked hugging. I'm glad you're here, buddy. It's raining demons! Hallelujah, it's raining demons! I tend to play games a second time around when I review it. I usually play it wrong the first time and need to fact check myself. This is already way shorter than its elders on top of a delayed release, so it wasn't too hard to replay. This wasn't an issue early in the game, but the further you get, the more rooms start to drag out a little too long until eventually they feel double the necessary length. This game's way of fleshing out runtime isn't timed objectives or exploration. It's just summoning more things into the room. Usually enemies that are undamageable until they show their weak spot, a timelessly fun enemy behavior in video games. Even though sword combos were given elemental effects and weapons were all pretty diverse, there isn't an intuitive system of certain things being weak to certain attacks. Everything kills everything after all, so just throw kitchen sinks until the front door unlocks. I could be totally wrong, but the game never articulated otherwise, so I'm led to assume outside of freezy barrels there's not much to strategize besides certain weapons working better at certain ranges. Also, compared to the second, this game feels like it's moving at three-fourths normal speed. It's especially evident during platforming parts. I wish they weren't so terrified of repeating design choices of the second game. It had a pretty good foundation to improve on, but I get why they mostly pretend it didn't exist. 3 is a great game that meaningfully wraps up the reboot trilogy. Who knew a protagonist named Lo Wang could be this complex and lovable a character? The highest honor I could possibly bestow him is a DLC slot on my non-existent all-star FPS. I rate it really good. Like, Okay human, but every second song is pork and beans. Maybe I was wrong about good FPS never reaching a trilogy. A triangle is the strongest shape after all. Not the most efficient, but the strongest. The next time I play an FPS, I think I'll... What are you looking at? That's a photo, it doesn't move. I think I'll put my arithmophobia aside and just enjoy it. Just in and wondering how he... Dropping my options, I reduced to one. Justin's coming to keep Dropping knowledge on me It's funk study